If you missed last week, um, you need to go back and watch it online because God did some great things. I think you can even tell it um, even throughout the day. I've just been going, man, it's just, it's obvious to me God's doing something good. And I just, it's just a great part of my life just to get to be a part of it. Um, Man, you can't really experience what we experienced last week if you watched it online, but you can catch up a little bit and it'll be helpful. We talked about how God puts the you in rescue. He put you and I in the role of rescuing people. And sometimes I spend a lot of time, man, looking at the mirror going, man, why God did you choose me? You know, I just don't fit the mold. I don't act like, look like this or do this thing. Sheila and I spent last week on a cruise with pastors, which is a trip for me, to be honest with you, because to be honest with you, it frustrates and kind of makes both of us feel awkward, me and the other pastors. So like, and so I just don't, sometimes I get up and go, I don't look like these guys, I don't act like these guys, these come from a different place, and, and I just don't always know, do I fit? And sometimes I kind of question, to be honest, does God put you in rescue? Like, did he really put me in this? And I go, man, I, I guess he does. And he just seems to do things uh, and, and use me to do it. He uses you to do it. And we talked about that last week, about how God put the you in rescue. It's not something that, that you do. It's how he rescues people and he uses people, regular people like us, to do it, and that is um, that was powerful. As we wrap things up last week, um, we gave everyone who was here one of these cool envelopes. Now, this envelope, if you weren't here last week, has uh, this little card in it that says "I found" and it has a blank. And you notice some people writing their word that they filled in the blank on the wall outside. I want you to do that. If you haven't already done it, go outside, grab one of those markers that's hanging there, and write on the wall. I found life. I found I found hope. I found healing. I found joy. I found companion. I found friends. I found whatever you found. Fill in the blank on that card. Write it on the wall out there, okay? That's what we want you to do. And we want that to be the place where you take selfies on Easter, you know? Like, I found, found it journey. So it's good stuff. And make sure that when you post it online, use the hashtag found at journey. That'll be good. So here's the deal that we got going on, though. We, hit, we gave everybody who was here not only this card in the envelope, but also one of these key finders. It's like a thing. If you went to Best Buy and you found, um, if you wanted to buy something like this one, you'd pay like 25 bucks for it. It's a key finder. You put it on your key ring. You install a little app. When you lose your keys, you find the app, and you push the button, and it makes your keys make a noise, and it's pretty cool. So we did that, but these weren't for you to take home and put on your keys. They were for you to take home and take this envelope and this card and this key finder and go find somebody you know, right, and care about them. Jesus found you. You find your friends, right, Because because found people find people. So we go and find people, and we go, hey, you know what? This is my story. This is what's going on. I found this at Journey Church, and you know what? Um, I want to invite you to, to attend church at Journey with me on Easter. And to be honest with you, if your friend goes, you know what, I don't really want to go to that church because it's weird looking. I get that tent thing, looks like a mosque, whatever. Okay, look at a giant onion. And your friend says, but I'll go with you to this other church. Skip going to Journey Church and go to that church with them. It's fine with us, okay? We care that you, in, that you invest in someone's life and invite them. We don't care where you go to church. So here's the deal. That's what we gave you these for. Now, if you want one for your key ring, you go out to the welcome out to the connection table and buy one. I think they're like seven bucks, okay? That just helps kind of offset the cost. The ones we're giving you are for you to invest in someone's life. So raise your hand if you got one of these last week. Okay, raise your hand up in the air. There's already a participation wake up. Put your hand in the air if you got one last week. If you didn't, if you're not one of the people who has one, has your air, hand in the air, you can go, you can get one of these from your section host. They'll be, they're wearing like the little lanyard thing. They'll be standing up later on. So make sure that you just say, hey, can I get one of those? I didn't get one last week. Okay. And if you are going, man, I gave away that one, or I've got one person kind of in mind for that one. And I, I need one more or two more or 10 more, whatever. If you want to invest them in someone else's life and you need a hundred more, just tell your section host, they'll get them for you, okay? You just give them a number, they'll go get them for you and give them to you, and you go invite people. That's what it's going to take for us to see people walk with Jesus. So make sure that you get those things. See your section host. They'll be the person standing up later with the land. You'll know exactly who they are. It'll make it real obvious. Or you can stop by the connection table and and they can help you. Okay, so that will be a huge, um, huge value. You're going to love that stuff. But God puts the you in rescue. And the big key of it is that all, all the time when we talk to people about coming to church, 
We say, hey, would you come to church for me? And people, their natural pushback is, well, the church just wants something from me. Now, that's not true. The journey, we want to give people something and give them something of value and invite them to be a part of a family where we find something of value. It's not where we want something from them. It's because we want something for them. And so invite your friends because value matters. Let me just kind of give you an illustration of that right now. Underneath one of your chairs, I've taped an envelope full of money. Look for it underneath your chairs. It's taped underneath your chair. You think I'm playing around. Reach under there, okay? Reach underneath there. Hold it up when you find it. Reach underneath there. There's, a, there's, light, there's an envelope. It's taped underneath there. It's full of money. Raise it up in the air. Raise it up, um, raise it up when you find it. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I'm for real. She's like, are you for real? She's like, I'm going to get on the floor. I know somebody's sitting in the chair, okay? They may have even felt me reach underneath there and tape it to the bottom of their chair. It's over here. <laughs> Did you, are you afraid to tear it out of there? <laughs> He's like, I think I'm tearing the chair up. I'm not sure. Did you get it? There, I heard it. Or I heard the chair rip. There you go. Look at that right there. That's it. Give it up. He, he found it. That's good stuff. Now, let me ask you this question. Why'd you look under your chair? That's a good question, isn't it? So why'd you, t- why'd you look under your chair? Why is that the first question everybody answers? The same thing that people said last service. Why, why'd you look under your chair? Because it's money, right? You're like, dude, I, I, I need 38 bucks. I'm still recovering from Christmas, right? So, like, so you just like, hey, $38, I'm, on, I'm in for that, an envelope full of cash. You looked under your, partially because I told you to, and you're good Christian people, right? And then the other part of it is because most of it is like there's cash under there. If I told you there's an envelope filled with used gum wrappers, nobody would look under your chair. You'd be like, I don't care if you're telling me to or not. I don't care. I want no envelope full of used gum wrappers. But you looked under there because there's some other kind of paper that for some reason people have told you is worth something. I mean, here, I I have this with me. It's a a $1 bill. This is a nice $1 bill. It has has a one printed on it. Now, is is this valuable because it has a one printed on it? It's not worth much. Let's use this one, for example. Here's a $50 bill. That's a little more. Okay. Is this valuable because it has a 50 printed on it? Or who is this guy? Grant? Is that Ulysses S. Grant? I don't know. Whatever. So <laughs> it was all about the Benjamins, right? But the, uh, but who, if you, if you, if I gave you this, and like I said, if this, um, this is not another illustration. You're just going to have to look at this one. But, um, <laughs> but if I, if I said to you this is valuable because it has a 50, a 50 printed on it and it, and it's green or it's some sort of shade of green. And I told you it was valuable because of that. You'd be like, no, it's not valuable because you said that. And it's not valuable because it has 50 printed on it. It's valuable because the U.S. government stands behind it and says that this is valuable. Now, that in and of itself could be questionable. I'm not going to lie. But, but the thing is that that's quest- that is of value because it has value standing behind it, not because it's something was said of its value. I have a friend, my friend Timmy, when uh, he was in high school, he, um, he was right when printers and bubble jet printers and scanners and all that stuff first came out. And so he scanned a couple of $20 bills front and back uh, into his mom's computer. And he printed it out on some really nice paper that he got from Office Max. And he crumpled it up a whole bunch and it looked, and it looked legit real, okay? Then Timmy thought, hey, I could go skiing with these $20 bills. But I don't want to go first to the skiing thing. So he started gas stations, and then he started grocery store. Then he started buying stuff, movie tickets and stuff. He went, then he thought, man, I could go skiing with this junk. So he printed out a whole bunch of them and went skiing, bought new skis, bought lift tickets, bought all the stuff he needed, had a blast, came back, was talking about his trip right up until the moment where the Secret Service came in to his high school in full-on combat, take down a guy gear, right? They're like blackout from head to toe. The AR, like the whole deal, ready to go. And it wasn't like, Tim, could you please come to the office? It wasn't like that. It was like, Tim, get your, you know what, on the floor, right? And like, and the cuffs and the dragon, it's a big deal. It, this stuff's not valuable because it has some numbers printed on it, right? It's valuable because somebody stands behind it. And the Secret Service, just in case you're curious about this, kind of takes that whole thing seriously, you know? They're not just playing. You can't just run off a few of your own, although that is tempting, to be totally honest. But, but the thing is that value isn't just understood. Value is because it's demonstrated. It's because the Secret Service takes that stuff so seriously that we know that money is valuable. See, people say all the time 
that, hey, I value you or I love you, right? We say that stuff, but value isn't something that we just say. It doesn't really matter that we say we love someone. What matters is that we demonstrate it because verbal love isn't valuable. Demonstrated love is what's valuable. There's a story, we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. We started off in the beginning of Luke chapter 15 and we talked about the, la- the lost sheep and how Jesus said that he would leave the 99 in the wilderness to go and chase the one and the one would bring joy. And we talked about how God puts the you in rescue and rescue always brings rejoicing and some unbelievable stuff we talked through last week. But the, the story goes on in the next couple of verses and um, it says this in verse eight. Or suppose, this is like the second example of it, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will, uh, will she not call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Now, here's the deal that I love. I mean, that's why right this very minute, they're they're throwing like one heck of a party because of Bianca's decision to to give her life to Christ and to follow him. That's huge, right? Now, we have a tendency to go, yeah, God loves us like everyone else, right? God loves me just like he loves everybody. We kind of feel like at times we're like, if I really had value, it it would feel more significant. Don't you feel that way sometimes? Like, Yeah, God loves me and everybody else, and I'm not even special. But understand something. What he says here is not the case. That doesn't make that the case. He says that there's joy in heaven. There's rejoicing that takes place when even one sinner repents. So even if only one sinner had repented, there would still be this eruption of complete joy because you repented. Because God loves you. I know that's hard to believe, right? I mean, that's hard to buy. It's hard to really accept that that God loves me because of things that we've been involved in or regrets that we have, or we're looking in a mirror and there's just, the world has told us that, that you don't have value unless you contribute something or unless you give something. You know, Sheila and I, I mentioned this earlier, spent um, the week on this cruise full of pastors, not full of pastors. In fact, there were only a hundred pastors and a hundred wives and, and of our wives, not for each one, like each pastor, one wife, got it. Okay, so pastors and wives, and then it's spring break. So 99.9% of this, you know, Royal Caribbean cruise liner is just filled with spring breakers, right? Spring breaking stuff, right? I mean, like they were just, it was nuts. And if I learned anything about spring break, it's that you are only valuable to the rest of the spring break crowd because of what you bring to the spring break crowd. Or in the, you know, consideration of bathing suits, what you don't bring to the spring break crowd is what apparently brings value. There's a lot less of those. Like, so, <laughs> so it was, it was not, it was interesting. But what I, what I learned really quickly is that, that our world tells you that you're only valuable on spring break, right? In our minds, we're going, yeah, I learned that. And now I'm 35 or 40 and 45 or 50. And, and I look back and I go, man, I, I just don't, I don't bring much value anymore. Or a relationship left you disappointed and you feel like you don't have anything valuable anymore. And so here's the deal. God loves you, not because of what you bring to him, but because he loves you and because of what he brings to you. So you're standing around going, man, I don't know if he can love me. I want you to know something. You can know that you're valued because of what has been paid for you. You can know your value because of what has been paid for you. In fact, if you look at it, you just think about this idea that God loves you. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, there's this verse where Paul says that you and I should not just look at our own needs, but we should look into the needs of others. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 says this. I love this verse. It's one of my favorites. It says, don't look out uh, after your own interests, but always take into the interest the others of others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And though he was God, he did not think of equality, look at this, as something that he had to hold on to or cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. That word is kenosis, and it means that he emptied himself. He 
spilled out the independent use of his deity. The way I would say it is that he laid down his use of the God card. He couldn't just play the God trump card anytime he wanted. He gave that up of himself. He loved you and I so much that he laid aside being God and demonstrated his love for us. And it says this, he gave up his design, divine privileges and he took on the human position of a slave and being born of a slave, born in, being born of a human being, when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. He died that death for you and I. You and I can know that we're valuable because of what was paid for us. We are valuable. You are valuable to God because of what's been paid for you. Now, I know what you're saying, or at least what I'm saying, is that, yeah, I could buy that a little bit. He kind of paid that for everybody, but people overpay stuff for stuff all the time. Maya and I were um, in Houston uh, last year, and we um, took, I went down there, took her with me to speak at a conference and hung out with some people, and, and, uh, and I went down there and took Maya with me, and we went to a movie in like a really ritzy neighborhood in Houston, and so we went to this movie, and we pulled up in there, and there were like, there were Bentleys and Maseratis and Lamborghinis and Ferraris and all kinds of crazy stuff, and so, you know, I'm taking selfies with these cars, you know, and looking at them like, all right, this is this, and I'm down here looking at this, trying not to drop my phone on the car, because I don't want to buy one, you know, and I'm Googling this car, I'm Googling stuff, and, and I'm looking, I'm like, this car's $300,000, and this car's two hundred. Maya has no idea what $200,000 is, right? So I'm looking, I'm like, Maya, this car is worth $340,000. Then it dawned on me, no, it's not. I mean, somebody could get you to give them three hundred forty dollars but, but the truth is it's not worth $340,000. There's no car on this planet that's worth $340,000. I'm sorry, right? So I take her into this, into the Davidoff Cigar store. Now, I like cigars, okay? So I took, took her in. I'm a really good dad. So like I said, come on in here. We're going to go in. This is a fancy cigar store. We went into their fancy humidor. She's like, Daddy, it stinks in here. I'm like, it, it'll be okay in just a minute. Like, you get used to it. <laughs> so, so I'm looking through, and I'm looking through. I'm like, look in. There's this $10 and 20 and 40 and 50 And I keep going, and I ask the guy. I'm like, hey, I'm not trying to be, like, weird about it, but what's the most expensive one? You know, and he shows me this one in this case in the middle of the room. And he says, this one right here, it's 5 hundred dollars a cigar. Look, I love cigars as much as the next guy who loves cigars, but five hundred dollars, there's no five hundred dollar cigar on this planet. There's just not, it just doesn't exist. You can charge me five hundred dollars for that. You might get some idiot to give you five hundred dollars, but it's not worth five hundred dollars. There's just nothing about it that's worth that much money. It's ridiculous. So there's part of us that goes, you know, how can I believe that when people are paying stupid things for cars or stupid things for a cigar or, or they're willing to pull up to that gas station, you know those couple in town that, that charge like 30 cents more a gallon than the one across the street? And you drive by and you're like, do you people not see that one? Like it's, it's, it's right here. Do you not want to pull up next to them and go, people, do you see that one right there, right? <laughs> it's like a big, can you just give me 30 cents? I'll go across the street and I'll bring it over to you. You know, like I can make money, you know, but... Do you see people overpay for stuff all the time? It's hard to believe our value if we're going to just go on what was paid for us. Jesus gave his life, and that might not be enough for you to believe that you, that you have value. But understand something. It goes deeper than that. You can know that you're valuable not just because of what was paid, but when it was paid. I mean, that's a big deal. Some of you might be familiar with the the recent cryptocurrency excitement, right? You've, you've heard that word, if never before, in the last couple of months, you know? There are all these, like, digital coins, and these digital coins all of a sudden hit this huge bump a few months ago. In fact, it was the week what, that Maya and I were in Houston. And, and, and they just all of a sudden went from near nothing of value or some value to, like, massive amounts. This one named Bitcoin went from, went from just a, a little bit of money to $12,000 per coin. Now, when everybody rushes in and goes, hey, it's valuable and buys it when it's, when it's expensive, that's not really demonstrating its value. That's demonstrating that they want something from it. What would be amazing is if you went back in time when those were maybe a dollar or two dollars a coin and somebody came in and said, you know what? This Bitcoin is valuable. I'll pay you full price even though it's not worth it. That's the story that Jesus tells in our story is that Jesus loved us and we can, you can know you're valuable because of when Jesus paid what he paid 
for you. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, but God demonstrated, he didn't just talk about his love, he didn't just say it, he didn't just feel it, he didn't just write us a cool song, you know, he demonstrated his love in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid full price when we didn't have value, when we thought we were worst off. Think of your, the moment, we talked about it a few weeks ago, that moment in your life that you're least proud of. That moment where you're like, oh man, I can't, I don't, I can't believe I did that. That moment where you feel the most ashamed, the, the darkest, worst moment, the one you don't want to talk about, right? In that moment, Jesus looked at you and would have died for your sins in that moment. When you feel like you are worth nothing, he bought you and paid everything. That's a powerful truth. You have value not just because of what was paid, but because of when he paid it. But the story doesn't end there because that would be an easy one to go, well, that's just dumb. That doesn't make any sense. Why did he do that? Maybe he didn't really do that for me. Maybe he did that for someone else. I want you to know this one thing about that. And I don't often talk about these words, but that phrase, when, while you were still sinners, there are more than just present and, and past tense in the Greek language. You know, like we have present and past tense and future tense. We have like, you know, this will happen or this has happened or this is happening. They have a fourth tense. And that's the tense that we read here. It's called the perfect tense. The perfect tense means that it's always true. It was true in the past. It'll be true in the future. It's true right this minute. And it's true all through all of those. And this one's written in the perfect tense. So when he says that you were demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, it really probably is better understood as while we were in sinning, while we were in the act of spitting in God's face or pushing away, he demonstrated his love for us. He knows your worst moment that you're least proud of, and he loves you there as much as he could. He loves you perfectly in that moment. You have value, not just because of what was paid, but because of when it was paid. And finally, you have, you have value because of who paid it for you. You know, Sheila and I have been in ministry now for a long time. And it, it, there comes these moments every once in a while when we'll be sitting at a, at, a, at a table and, you know, we're eating dinner and we're going through and just kind of eating. And then I get a little bit frustrated after a while because I'm like, is he ever going to bring the check, you know? And so I'll flag our waiter down and I say, hey, dude, you know, can I get, I'll just get the check whenever. And he goes, oh, man, I forgot to tell you, it's already been paid for. And I'm like, you know, it always blows our mind. I'm like, huh? What do you mean? And, oh, somebody picked up your check. They didn't want you to know who. And I'm like, man, that, uh, that's just, I mean, we'll live on that, like, for weeks. It's just so exciting. So, but, um, but what I mean by that is, that, like, there's that moment when somebody pays something for it. But in, in my mind, I'm, you know, going through, you know, because just, it's human, right? I'm going through, who could it be? Who could it be? Could it be? And every once in a while, I'll be like, oh, you know, we saw this person or those people. I bet they did it. And what amazes me is when it's somebody who can't afford it. You know, and I'm like, man, I know, I know that that's hard for them. And man, that kind of generosity is huge. And it just, it just, it matters, doesn't it? It doesn't just matter that somebody paid something for you, but it matters that who paid it. And what happens to us sometimes is we can forget how valuable we are. Understand something. It doesn't just tell us that we're valuable because of, of what was paid. It doesn't just tell us what was, that we are valuable because of when it was paid. Get this. The King of kings and Lord of lords stretched out his arms and died for our sins so that you and I could have a relationship with him. Who paid it? It's not the president. It's not a king. It's not some big name. It's not just, it's not just some, some big person or some famous person. Jesus loved you and died for you. You know, on March 16th, I remembered this verse. I don't remember it because I'm calling it to memory, but I think of it. I always think of it as 316 days, John 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. Wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. The God of the universe demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died so that we could have a relationship. You have value. You are loved. 
you. Not the person behind you, not your spouse, not your kids, not somebody else who didn't do what you did, not somebody else who doesn't have the regrets. You are loved, and God wants to have a relationship with you. Now, here's what's powerful. Is you and I have heard that story, maybe even over and over and over again. If you're here today, and there's two kinds of people, those of you who are like, yeah, I'm in on that relationship. We'll talk in a minute. And then there are some of you who maybe are just kind of on the bubble. Maybe you're thinking, I want to give my life like Bianca did. I want to follow Jesus. I want to begin to take next steps in my relationship with him. And if that's your story, Bryce will be over here afterwards, and he would love an opportunity to talk with you. We'd love to help you take that next step. We would love to do that with you, allow you to ask questions, push back. You don't have to have all the answers. It's okay just to move forward one step today. Just come over here after the service is over. But if you're here today and you're already in on that, you already get that relationship, you're, you're behind that, I want you to get something. God didn't give you that gift for you just to sit on until, until eternity starts. Eternity started right then, and he calls you and I to help people understand that God put the you in value. You and I live in a world where we've heard that story over and over again. We've heard about our value. You may have trouble believing it, but we've heard it over and over again that God loves you and gave his life for you, and he wants to have a relationship with you. You and I are unbelievably privileged. In fact, if you live indoors, you have a a whole room that you've dedicated just to store your car in, right? Like you have a special room that protects your car from the elements. You and I are the 1% of the richest people on the planet. We've heard this story over and over and over again of God's unbelievable love. But I want you to know something. Not everybody's heard that story. That's why we plant churches. 2010, we planted Journey Church. We started next door at Fun Zone. And and it was just, it's a powerful story. Many of you were there. We rolled up our sleeves and we made it happen. And we did it because we love people and we want people to walk with Jesus. And that matters. Since day one, we've always prioritized planting churches. Journey Church is a church plant that plants churches that plant churches. We are a reproductive church plant. As soon as we hit the ground, we started. From day one, we've always set aside 10% of every dollar. I've said it every time we talk about it, and I'll say it until I die. It passes through us like a Crystal's cheeseburger. We barely even touch it, right? It just goes right through us, right? So, so we pull that money in, and we invest it in church planting. We care about it. That's how. When we started in 2010, that 10% is how in 2011, we were able to plant a brand new church in, in, uh, in uh, Las Brisas, Ecuador, Why do we plan in Ecuador first? Two reasons. Not everybody has the privileges you and I have to hear the gospel every single day. And the second reason is it's cheaper to plant a church in Ecuador, go figure that, than it is to plant in the States. We could plant 10 in in Ecuador for every one we could plant here. And people in Ecuador need to hear about Jesus. And it mattered to us. So we planted in Las Brisas, Ecuador in 2011. That's a big deal. We were able to plant a brand new church and we weren't even a year old yet. But that wasn't the end of the story. Not only did we plant that church in 2011, but we also sponsored a lot of the kids that live in that community and go to the Compassion International uh, services that are provided in that community. We love Compassion International. We've always been supportive and love Compassion. That's why you see a lot of our, our section hosts wearing a Compassion shirt today, because today's Compassion Day for us. And we're gonna put this whole thing into action because here's the thing that we love about compassion. They love, and they love kids, and they are committed to eradicating extreme poverty in Jesus' name during our lifetime. If they have their way about it, extreme poverty like what happened in Las Brisas, Ecuador, will not exist by the time we pass away. That's fantastic goals, man. That's huge. But here's the deal. Compassion loves kids. Compassion loves to help people out of poverty. But here's the deal. Compassion loves the local church, loves churches like ours and churches like the one we started in Las Brisas. And they're so committed to helping kids in poverty that they will not help them unless they can help through the local church so that when they bring in life-saving services like education and nutrition and, and, uh, and, and um 
uh, uh, health care and, and other services that they love on and tell kids about and share the gospel with them, when they bring those life-saving services and they bring it through the hands of the local church so that ultimately Jesus gets the credit and ultimately they're able to develop a relationship with their pastor and with the people at their church and able to know and, and come to a saving understanding and, and walk with Jesus. That's a powerful story, except for when there are churches like, like Las Brisas that are so poor that they can't afford to have a local church. Nobody's ever planted or started a church there because they're so poor. And that is exactly the condition we found Las Brisas in. And that is what we did. We answered that question. Well, then we'll start a church. We'll build a building, hire a pastor. Let's get them in there. Let's fund that and care about them and develop a relationship with them. 2011, we started. We can't stop there, right? We, 2014, we took us a few years of saving up to start a U.S. church. We saved up money here. We recruited other partners, and we together planted a church just outside of Memphis in Collierville, um, uh, over uh, toward Memphis, an autonomous church plant, engaged church, up and running today. And they're, they're loving people and caring about them. It's a, it's a multicultural church and you can walk in and you couldn't, you couldn't identify one dominant race that kind of runs the place. It's, it's everybody from all kind of places. It's pretty, it's a powerful story. Really cool stuff. But we can't be done there, right? There are still churches, there are still communities all throughout Ecuador, all throughout Central and South America where, where, where kids are still dying in poverty because their churches, their, their community is so poor they can't have a local church. So we've got to answer the call again. So in 2017, let tail end, uh, Scott Holloway, one of our elders and I uh, represented our church and went down um, to Ecuador and we were able to spend some time with the compassion staff, with another church and with the kids and people of Puerto Lopez, Ecuador. I mean, it became really obvious. Look at these folks. This is pretty awesome. Um, it, look at there. The, it became real obvious real quick that this is where God had our church. Uh, we were able to lay eyes on kids who were so excited just at the idea that someone would come in and care about their community enough to plant a brand new church and to have a place where they could go and get education, where they could go and get health care, where they could go and get nutrition, where their moms could go and get prenatal care, where their mom, uh, where they could ultimately be able to give birth to a healthy baby and then be carried through those first years and just be able to be invested in personally. These kids were so excited. They like, this, this whole community threw us a party. I felt like the weirdest, like, kind of tension, you know? Like, on one hand, I was so excited to see their excited faces, and on the other hand, they were treating us like we were rock stars. I mean, they threw this party, check this out. I mean, it was unbelievable. They were unglued, and they were like, it was crazy love. I mean, just, they were just so excited to have somebody who cared about them. They had to hold this in a community nearby just to have a space to hold it in. It was an unbelievable experience and it became real obvious to us that our next step as a church was to plant yet one more church in, in, in Puerto Lopez, Ecuador. Now here's the deal. Puerto Lopez is a community that's so poor, so difficult to reach that it just, it doesn't have its own church. So we had to plant a church and now Compassion International will move in those life-saving services. But here's the deal. They go out and sponsor, they go out and get those 200 kids, get them in services. But the truth is they don't have a sponsor. So immediately we have, and not, not just an opportunity, we have a responsibility to sponsor our kids in Puerto Lopez. Our kids in our church that we planted in the communities around there, we have an opportunity, a responsibility to plant those kids, to, to care for and sponsor those kids. You might wonder why we take $38 underneath someone's seat. It's because $38 is what it takes to sponsor one kid, $38 a month. I know, I know you've heard all this stuff and like the guild trips of a cup of coffee and all this other stuff, but the truth is that it's that simple. This doesn't just bring food, other things. This brings the life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ into these communities. So you and I have an opportunity to start a church, to develop a relationship with a kid, and then to go and see and work with that kid and actually be in their community and paint their house and care about their roof and love on their family and build their church. That's fantastic stuff. So here's the deal. In a minute, the, your uh, section hosts are gonna stand up and they're gonna have a bunch of packets. 
And these packets will have a beautiful little picture on it of a boy or girl that lives in our community or the one right near close by. We've sponsored a lot of the ones from our community. But there'll be those pictures. And inside of that packet, there's some information about your kid. There's this one's Angelie and Angelie's community, her compassion in Ecuador, stuff that's going on in her life, how you can get more information about her, some of the services that she, that she will uh, receive as a part of your sponsorship. Attached to the bottom of that is a little card that looks a lot like this one. And it has a space for name and information on one side and the amount of your sponsorship. If you decide to sponsor a kid today and you want to sponsor them at $38 a month, you just check $38 a month. You can also add seven more dollars a month if you want to and, and be a part of um, establishing help for HIV and AIDS and other pandemics that are uh, malaria and other things that are present in their greater community. So that would be $45 a month. You don't check both of them. You just check one or the other, okay? And you fill out your information. On the other side of it is credit card or debit card information. You just do it. You fill it out there. Turn it back in. If you um, want to, you can put it in this envelope and, uh, and hand it into them. That'll protect your information. You can hand that back to your section host, and they will, um, they'll take care of that, given, turning that into us. We sponsored 35 kids in the last service. I think this service can do 100 kids. I, I really do. I think that you could do it. I think we could leave today not having one single kid to sponsor our, uh, to sponsor left in Puerto Lopez. I mean, our first service was really nice to you, like leaving you some kids to sponsor. It was really kind of them. So, so here's the deal. We need to sponsor these kids. This is a huge opportunity. Now, here's what's going to happen. In a minute, they're going to stand up and offer these to you. You can choose a boy or a girl. Here's what's not going to happen, okay? You're, we're not going to like go, hey, can I look for a cute one? That one's too ugly. That one's too ugly. That one's, oh, I want that one, right? We're not going to play that game, okay? We're, we're the, you just, you chose the seat. God put you in the seat where you're at. God put the packets in their hands, and God's going to choose the one that they hand you. So just take it as a divine, you know, you just take it as God's sign that you're supposed to sponsor that kid. And, and you know what? Here's the deal. Like, you're not going to sort through and go, no, that one's okay. He can starve, and then I'll eventually go to hell because I sent him there. That, don't do that, okay? <laughs> you don't really go to hell. That was kidding. So here's the other thing. And here's the other thing that's not going to happen, okay? You, I, I know how this goes. You're like, oh, I want my kids to be here. I want to experience this with them. You're not going to go get kids. You're not no go getting your kids and bringing them in here. They weren't, they weren't around when you conceived them. There's no reason for them to be around when you conceive this one, okay? So, so you just fill this thing out. So they're going to give them up. They're going to give them this thing. You're going to have a few seconds to fill that thing up. So here's the deal, okay? Are you ready? We need a ton of you to sponsor a kid. This isn't something somebody else is going to do. You're going to do this. Here's the one last thing that's not going to happen, okay? If you take this packet, you cannot leave the room with this packet without giving us wherever that went. Where did it go? Out somewhere? Okay. Well, here. We'll use that to represent it. Okay. You cannot leave the room with this packet without leaving us that card. That is absolutely vital. There's only one of these in the world today. There's only one of these packets printed. And if you leave here with this today, it will be months before they recognize it's not there and that it's not coming back and they print out another one. And all that time, this kid will go unsponsored. This kid needs you today. So here's the deal. If you want to sponsor them, you just write out your, your information on the back. You write it, fill out your credit card information, your debit card information. If you're like, oh, you know what? I really want to pay in cash. You can just put cash in the envelope in this thing. That's fine. Or you can just say, you know what? I don't want to pay it right now, but I'll do it later. Just flip it over, write pay later, and make sure that your address and your information is on there and turn it back in. They'll send you a bill and take care of it. Okay, it does not matter that you absolutely pay today, but what does matter is this packet cannot leave this room unless we have the card. You give us the card, this is yours to keep. You don't give us the card, you give it all back, okay? So you just have to look into the eyes of that beautiful little child and say, I can't do this today. Okay, so you, <laughs> you do that. That's on you. Okay, so here's the deal. Heavy guilt trip. There's the card, I was looking for it. Okay, so... Ready? Are you guys ready for this? Are you, like, you can look at your wife or your husband right now and just nod your head, okay? Because you're going to do this, all right? It's all right. So you look at your husband, or maybe you're going, I can't afford 30 bucks a month. So look at somebody else and give them the thumbs up and see if they'll split it with you. They'll do it, okay? It's good. This is unbelievably valuable, okay? On three, they're going to stand up and we're going to make something happen, okay? One, two, 
three. Here we go. These are our section hosts. They've got these cards. You just tell them, I want a boy or I want a girl. You just say, I just take a boy. You could, like, sponsor one for the—you got—